Yeah. All right, it's half past. Everybody, there's a few shares chattered about. Find a space. Folks can scan on the way out if you didn't get scanned. I'll try to just grab as many as I can. That's She's great. desperate to scan you, so don't <laughs> leave without it. All righty, let's get going. Uh, good morning. Um, when I was 17, I had an epiphany in the reference section of the Rickmansworth Public Library. I was waiting for my brother, flipping open books, and I came across this thing called the Dictionary of Proto-Indo-European. And what is this thing? It's, it's a dictionary with words and their meanings, and you look at some of the words and they look kind of familiar. Um, of a language that was dead 50, 100 generations before the invention of writing. Blew my mind. How, how is such a thing possible? How is it imaginable even that you could have rules, that you could in, you know, create this abstraction to encompass the messy details of dozens of languages spanning the globe uh, using some kind of mathematical analysis? Changed my life. Uh, I wouldn't be here today without that moment where the intersection of mathematics and linguistics uh, is search. And so what I hope to offer you today is, if not an epiphany, <laughs> maybe for some of you, um, an abstract model that can help you understand the diversity of search in Mark Logic. So we're going to be talking about search, but search a little slantwise. Search not as you're used to thinking about search. Um, and a lot of what we think of, or what I think of as search-related features, and you think, what does that have to do with search? And so I hope I can give you some understanding of how these things fit together and, and help you navigate that space. So search, abstractly, mathematically, it's a relation between queries and documents. You feed in queries, you get out documents. Uh, double clicking a little bit in Mark Logic is a compound relation. It gets you from queries to terms. This is query formulation. This is what uh, XMP plan will show you. And from terms to documents. This is index lookup or index resolution. And this term, term, is a pretty generic concept in Mark Logic. Uh, words, sure, phrases but also a diversity of just facts about documents. The fact that a particular JSON property has a particular numeric value. Uh, the fact that a particular element has a particular child element. Uh, the fact that there's particular security constraints in it. Uh, so that's a very abstract concept. And I'm, because I'm not satisfied with the level of abstraction I've already thrown at you, I'm going to make it more abstract yet. I'm going to start talking about rules, um, because some of the things I'm going to be talking about today are not queries in the sense of CTS queries, but they behave in very much the same way. Uh, so I'm going to start talking about rules. And most of what I'm going to be talking about for rules, you can hear query, but I'm going to get into areas where that isn't actually going to be true anymore. There's a, another aspect of search, which is scoring. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about scoring today. Uh, I think it was, was it last year, the year before? I forget. I did a whole talk about scoring. You can go find the video online somewhere. Um, but at this level of abstraction, scoring, what is it? It's just a measure of the strength of the relation from queries or rules to documents. And let's stick a pin in that. We'll get back to that in a minute. It's the strength of that relation from queries to documents. So now we've been, we have this relation from queries to documents, and because we think mathematically, or at least I do, um, we say, well, can we flip it around? Does it make sense? Is there a relation from documents to queries? What would that mean? What would that look like? And I've given away my own punchline by putting the slide up already. Yeah, sure, that's reverse search. It is essentially the relation flipped around. Instead of feeding in queries and getting out documents, you're feeding out in documents and getting out queries. And it too is a compound relation mediated by terms. So you're going from documents to terms. This is term extraction, essentially what indexing does as well. Uh, and we'll see some APIs that get more directly at that. 
and you're going from terms to queries. And this is the reverse index lookup, mediated through the reverse index instead of the universal index. So this is going to be, this is sort of our uh, skeleton of our dictionary of Proto-Indo-European for search. Um, we have these various kinds of relations among these uh, entities. <coughs> Excuse me. And what we're going to look at is how can we combine these relations between what we have and where we want to go and join them together with the various APIs that MarkLogic provides you to get from here to there. And I'm going to do this in the context of a little citizen scientist application. You've seen these. I, I got a bunch of these on my phone. I don't know if you guys do. But this one is Wildlife Observer. So the idea here is you have people, they have this app on their phone, and they go hiking the beautiful open space we have in the Bay Area, and they see some interesting bit of wildlife, or a squirrel, and they enter a little observation about it. It gets uploaded to the server, uh, tagged with the time, the location, and now your preserve managers, your wildlife managers, can use that information uh, to help manage the preserve, manage the wildlife, do their jobs find things out about what's going on. Uh, so here's an observation. Uh, this is a particularly exciting observation, actually. Um, Kim Camper has observed at this time and location uh, this particular animal and has entered some notes about this. Uh, for those of you who aren't up on your Latin, this is a mountain lion. Uh, and this is actually a, a historically accurate time and location for this kind of observation. So, our first question might be, uh, you know, I saw, that, I saw that squirrel observation. I think, oh my gosh, you know, is my preserve being overrun by these invasive squirrels? I want to find all the squirrel observations on my preserve. So what do I have? I have the boundary of my preserve. Uh, I know what a squirrel is called. What I want is observations. So this is, this is straight up search. I'm going from rules to documents. So I'm going to make rule to fetch documents. So you know we're going to we're going to start slow. Believe it, we're going to we're going to go much further. So here we go. We've constructed a rule, a query, a composite query using and query of a word. That's one term, and this geospatial query now um, that is going to be targeting the location, the GPS location in the observation. Uh, and I've alighted the preserved boundary because. Believe me, it would go on for the next 20 slides if I didn't. Uh, and so this is, this is a pretty simple, combined, full text, geospatial search. I'll leave it for two seconds so you can actually look at it. I have a habit of going too fast. Slow me down if you need to. So what are we seeing? We've gone from rules to documents. My little icon on the bottom is backwards, sorry about that. And the tool we're using is CTS Search and the CTS Query Constructors. All right, let's uh, ask a different question. I want to know what preserve this observation occurred in. You know, maybe this observation, you know, they were walking somewhere along the quarry trail. Are they in Montebello Preserve? Are they in San Antonio open space? You know, they're not going to know. Someone may have knocked over the boundary marker. Um, maybe we want to alert the preserve manager whenever an observation in their preserve comes in, right? So what do we have? We have the observation with its location, document. What do we want? The preserve based on that location. So this is actually exactly backwards of what we just saw. We're now going from documents to rules. So we're going to use, so here's our preserve boundary as a rule, as a query. We're storing it in a document in the database so we can search for it. And it's the same rule we just saw. Same exact thing. But now it's going to be the target of our operation using reverse query. So that's what reverse query is about. And we're going to see a lot of reverse query today. It's about going from documents to rules instead of from rules to documents. I'm not sure I want to open the floodgates, but go ahead. Just a quick question, because I'm kind of a novice. So are, are you implying that you could then search through the documents for the rules, for like the constructors 
constraints that, that, that you put in the documents? And yeah, I mean, essentially what this has done is I've stored my rule, my query, within a document, and now I can use reverse query to search it, but to search it with an understanding of its semantics as a query. So just recap, this is reverse search, going from documents to rules using CTS reverse query. So whenever you think, I want to I wanna find a rule based on a document, your first thought should be reverse query. All right, I want to engage my users, keep them using my, my app and coming back for more. So I want to make suggestions to them based on their interests and capabilities. So this is a matchmaking scenario where I want to match uh, species with users. So this is, we're actually going to go both ways at the same time. And this always hurts my brain a little bit. I don't know about you guys. The way to think about this is the forwards query is, what do I want from you? And the reverse is, what do you need from me? So let's sort of unpack that a little, see how that plays out. So here's our user profile of Kim Camper. And Kim is fairly monomaniacal and is interested in mammals, nothing else. And so we've encoded this as a query in uh, Kim's profile. So this is going to be the query going forwards that we're going to use. And Kim has some capabilities. Uh, Kim is an expert observer. Kim observes in the mornings and has a few very particular skills. This is going to be what we use for the reverse part of the, of the matchmaking operation. Here's the other side of it, the species. So here's a description of a particular species, the classification, uh, some description. This is going to be the target of the forwards part of the matchmaking. And now this is going to be the target of the reverse part of the matchmaking. So this is what this species is going to impose as requirements on the observers. So this is a, uh, this is a mountain lion. So the first thing is we're not going to send novices to go look for mountain lions. Uh, that would not be a good idea. Uh, and mountain lions are crepuscular, so they're active dawn and dusk. So we're only going to um, match them with observers who are observing during those times. And so this is now going, like I said, the target of the reverse part. So now we've got the fours combined with the reverse. And it looks very simple. It is very simple. <laughs> the, it's simply a search that is combining the forwards query, rules to documents, with the reverse query, documents to rules. And you can put them together in the same search operation to create this matchmaking. So what are we seeing? When you want to do matchmaking, you're going both ways. Rules to documents, documents to rules. And so you're going to use CTS search both with the forwards query operations and the CTS reverse query. All right, what's our next problem? I want to know what kind of habitat that observation occurred in. Maybe my observer didn't say specifically. Maybe we're not trying to impose too many burdens on them. So there's just a textual description. So what do we have? We have observations. And we have, let us say, some lovingly handcrafted rules that describe, that, that uh, are used to indicate certain habitats. I'll show you an example in a sec. And what we want is the habitat. So we want the rule. So what do we, what's the first thing we think when we go from documents to rules? Reverse query, correct. Um, the other thing we care about is we wanted some measure of uncertainty, scoring of a sort. But now remember what I said. Scoring is a strength of the relation from rules to documents. We're going the other way. Score, CTS score, CTS confidence aren't measuring that relation. Uh, and as any of you have ever actually tried this know, they don't. So we're going to use a trick. And for every matching rule, we're going to run things the other way to get the forwards relation and measure the strength of that using CTS confidence. Um, that sounded complicated. We'll see. It's actually not that complicated once I show you. So here's a potential rule. 
Um, there's a few words and phrases that we think indicate this kind of habitat. This is riparian, that means streams. Uh, is this a good rule? Um, maybe, our expert said it was. Again, I want to stick a little pin in that because maybe it is and maybe it isn't. Now maybe it is good and then you start adding marine preserves and now it isn't. But let's just keep that in the back of your head for later. So here we are, we're matching the observation to the rule. Reverse query, we've seen this already. <laughs> and here is the trick. We're taking that matching rule that we found and we're running the search the other way against the document we have in our hand. And we're getting the confidence, CTS confidence out of that. So the strength of that forwards relation, which is what CTS confidence measures. Uh, and I'm just using CTS confidence here instead of score because CTS confidence is capped uh, to one. So it's, it's scaled. So all of them will be sort of commensurate with each other. Have I baffled anyone yet? I'm trying my best. OK, this is rule-based classification. Um, we're going from documents to rules. And here the rules are what encode our expert knowledge. And we'll see this. We're going to go through a few classification examples here. There's expert knowledge somewhere. Uh, here it's in, it's in the, the person who sat down and made all those rules for you. Um, a point about scalability here. We, we've got customers that run maybe um, hundreds of thousands of rules against millions of documents a day. So in terms of performance scalability, uh, this, this is as scalable as any other kind of search you would expect from ArcLogic. Uh, where it's not scalable is in the fact you had to lovingly handcraft those rules. So unless you have some distributed, you know, everyone's creating their own rule kind of scenario, uh, you're not going to come up with a lot of rules probably. Let's take a slightly different classification task where we're going to expand our preserve. We've got some money and uh, there's some potential parcels we might buy. And we want to know what habitats are represented by those parcels of land, see how they fit with our overall plan for our preserve. So what do we have? We have our existing parcels of land in which we know what habitats those are. So someone has sort of said, OK, this has got riparian, this has got scrub, forest, whatever. And we want now the new parcels um, classified with the habitats. So we want the habitats. Here, we're going to use a different kind of classification called SVM classifier. Uh, this stands for Support Vector Machine. And we're going to train it to construct rules. So we're going to go from documents mediated through terms, in this case term vectors, to get rules. And then we're going to use the classifier then to classify uh, the unlabeled uh, parcels. So again, documents mediated by term vectors to get rules. Scoring here it comes along for the ride. This is part of SVM is you get a distance metric. And it's a metric in all the good sen mathematical senses of the word, the triangle inequality, all that good stuff. Uh, so there is actually a real measure. You're getting out of this at the end of the day. So here's training the classifier. Um, you are passing in a sample that has been labeled. So the sample and the labels of it and some options. Um, now there's a whole methodology really that needs to be applied here in practice to training uh, classifiers. Um, and I will say that People get a little locked on that and say, oh, it's so complicated, I have to tune in. Like, yes, you do. Uh, but let's pull that pin out I put in earlier about your handcrafted rules. You really should be doing that for those, too. It's just because you can see what the words are, as opposed to it's some mathematical black box, people tend to feel that they don't need to actually do that. Uh, they, they feel more comfortable with it. Um, and that's fine. but. If you really want to know how good are your rules, you really need to do some of the same methodology in both circumstances. Um, and the other thing I would say is less is more. Uh, here I've capped the number of terms to 20. And honestly, you want a small number of terms that you're actually using in your term vectors. The default is to use all possible terms. And 
um, it's a shame that's the default because that actually produces terrible results. Um, so I would always set a low number of max terms if you're going to play with this and then adjust it up and down accordingly. Uh, because what happens is you get, what, you get overfitting. You get accidental correlations just messing up your data. And this is what you get out of it. It's, as I said, it's a term vector. And these are the terms or representations of the terms. They've got an ID, which is our internal ID for them. Uh, and then these coefficients. <laughs> he told me not to do this. The coefficients. And some are positive and some are negative, right? Some are positively correlated with that class and some are negatively correlated with that class. So this is a rule. It's a different form of a rule, still constructed out of terms. Uh, but more directly than a CTS query is represented as terms. And here's how you'd use it. Uh, once you've trained this thing, you, you could squirrel it away forever uh, and just reuse it. And you hand new documents in with this. And what you get out is the matching, uh, the matching rules with a score value which may be positive or negative. You'll actually get out. This is not a member of this class by a long way, or a little way. Um, we only care about the ones that are actually in, so we're only using positive ones here. OK? So this is classic, straight up SVM classification. We're still going from documents to rules. But now these are SVM class rules. So they're not CTS queries like we had with rule-based classification. Here are expert knowledges coming from whoever sat down and labeled your samples in the first place, the selection of the samples, uh, maybe a little of the methodology in deciding whether you're getting good results. Uh, and the tools here are CTS train and CTS classify. Now, the first thing you're going to say is, I'm not sure I entirely trust these SVM classes. It's just a bunch of numbers. That's a little scary. I don't know what they mean. And this is why people tend to like rule-based classification, because you can look at the rule, and you can know why you got a match. You look at SVM class, and you say, it's a bunch of numbers. I don't know. Uh, so can you get some transparency uh, in what those SVM classes actually have in them? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Uh, there's an option. Oops, <laughs> I got ahead of myself. Before we get to transparency, uh, let's get to selecting samples. This is the other thing that is tricky about SVM classification, right? How do I get the samples? Um, the first thing I'd say about that is what I said before, less is more. You actually need much smaller sample sets than you want. And if your sample set is too large, it, you'll actually get worse results. Um, if it's too large a fraction of your, um, your population, uh, what happens is that it introduces so much noise that you're, you're actually classifying on the noise and not the signal. So getting samples can be tricky. Uh, here's a way you might get samples. If you had the habitat rules, so we have rules already, but there's query handcrafted queries. Um, and we still want to do the SVM training. Um, so we need a sample. But we don't have labeled samples. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our handcrafted rules to label a set of samples. So we're going to get from the, those rules to a set of documents. And now we can do what we did before. We're going to take those documents train them up to get SVM class rules. This is a simple hybrid, right? So here, you're saying, what is the advantage of this over just using the rules directly? Well, one advantage is there may be your expert wasn't really that expert, and there were a lot of terms they didn't think of. By training this through the SVM classifier, that will pick up correlations. It might be important. It might be interesting that you wouldn't have thought of. That's one. The other, so you're augmenting your expert knowledge in a way, implicitly. Uh, the other thing it's giving you is uh, you don't have to think too hard about getting samples. You have to think hard enough to come up with some, some bootstrapping rules 
And so you can actually iterate this and, and fine tune it, right? You sort of have some basic rules that get you somewhere and then use that to get a better set of samples and you know, overall improve. So it's a way to get started. So we're, we're still using CTS training and classify and also CTS search. And now um, here's the part where I got ahead of myself. You want transparency, right? This is the scary thing about SVM classifiers. They're just a bunch of numbers. Uh, and so there's actually an option to CTS train that will show you what the terms are. It's details equals true. Now it's super verbose. You'll get, you'll get really large things out of this. Because as, you know, as before we, we saw about a dozen terms, now we're seeing one or not even quite a whole of one. So we're seeing the term. There's its term ID. There's its uh, coefficient. Uh, and this is a, some kind of phrase, rock outcrop. And so you can look at that and say, yeah, rock outcrop, I like that. That, that look works for me. A lot of times you'll see stuff and you'll say, that's completely crazy. What is that doing in there? And what that is, is it's overfitting, right? There was some accidental correlation in your sample set that the math said was meaningful. And you say, I know better. Um, the, the way, I mean, just demystifying SVM classification a tiny bit, right? It is just picking the set of coefficients and the set of terms that minimize the error in labeling your sample. And if you know, some accidental correlation would have improved that labeling of your sample, it's going to go with it. Um, and if your sample is not necessarily representative, that can be a problem. So you can look at some of these and you'll say, that's crazy, and take it out. Now, it would have increased errors in your sample. But maybe it improves things overall, right? Sometimes you'll see stuff in here and you'll think it's a little crazy, but maybe it isn't, right? This is the, it just so happens Corona drinkers tend to vote Republican phenomenon, right? And you, you wouldn't have thought of that in advance, but maybe it's true. So be a little cautious uh, if you go down this road. Um, but it may be, it may be that you, know, you can exercise a little human judgment here. So this is still straight up SVM classification, but with a little uh, transparency and human judgment applied. All right. Maybe you just, you really don't trust this statistical black box thing, y you know. Uh, just the thought of some computer telling you what is and isn't, yeah, yeah, I don't want, I don't want any part of that. But, uh, you know, maybe you like having the metric part of it. Um, you know, an actual how close is something to the classes. So here we're going to say I have some selected samples or maybe I have rules and I still want to do SVM classification. I still want to construct now an SVM classifier rule. Well, it's constructed out of terms. So where am I getting my terms from? I can get my terms from my CTS query rules. I can get my terms from my sample documents. Uh, and then construct my class rule out of that and do SVM class guy just as before. How can I do that? Well, uh, if I want to get terms out of documents, I can use distinctive terms. Uh, and so here's a little example of some terms you might see. And that term ID there, it's the same term ID that you'd have in your SVM class. Um, the decision you're going to have to make if, if you want to construct a classifier like this is what should the coefficients be? Uh, they need to be between minus one and plus one. Uh, so I would suggest maybe plucking the confidence out of there. Or maybe, uh, you know, just saying everything is one or zero. And here are terms out of a query. So this is query plan. This is what query plan is telling you. And so here we've taken our, uh, you know, our lovingly handcrafted habitat rule and we're plucking the terms out. And the, these, ter these keys, those are the term IDs. Same, same IDs, same keys. And here again, you're going to have to come up with some decision about what coefficients to use. 
uh, you may just scale the weights. Uh, that's, that's a possible approach. So, constructed SVM classification. What have we done? We've constructed SVM class rules out of terms from CTS queries or documents. So documents are rules to terms to rules, and then classification as before. So the tools we're using to get at the terms are distinctive terms, to get terms from documents, or XDMP plan, which can give you terms out of queries. And then we're just, we're using normal document construction from that. All right, let's move on to a completely different problem. Um, I want to do, I don't want to do entity extraction, basically. Um, I've got observations and I have some handcrafted rules for particular entities, like species. Um, and I want my observations with the matching uh, entities marked up in, in line. So I'm going to go from documents to rules and then on to the matching terms. So documents to rules, say it with me, reverse query. And the Next part of that, um, there's a couple of APIs, CTS Highlight, uh, CTS Walk, and we're going to use CTS Highlight in this case. So here's a rule for an entity, uh, a species, a mountain lion, some various phrases that indicate that. And we're doing reverse query again, same thing we've seen about, I don't know, four or five times now. And this is the part where now we're plucking out the matching terms. Uh, this is CTS highlight. Now CTS highlight only works with CTS query kind of rules, um, but it will mark up in line all the matching terms that match that query. And the rest of this is the fold left magic is just a way of iterating. So the results of one markup pass feeds into the next markup pass. So you don't have to construct crazy loops to keep track of things. You just do it all in one fell swoop. All right. So entity extraction is really classification plus an extra step, the identification of the matching terms. Uh, so the tool here is CTS reverse query again, uh, as well as CTS highlight to find the matching terms. All right, let's take something a little different. Suppose I have ob my observations, but now I have F SVN classes. So I don't have CTS queries now, but highlight and walk that give me the matching terms want there to be a CTS query. Uh, can, I, can I still use these classes in some way to do this? Yes. We're going to construct rules out of terms. So we're going to construct query rules out of terms We've got the terms in our SVM class, they're right there. And then we're going to do any extraction as before. And what this is giving us is an inferential, I mean, the terms in the class don't indicate the presence directly of something, but they are associated with it. So this is more inferential, right? So here, here I'm constructing the query out of the SVM class. It's just plucking the terms out and sticking them in a big or query. Uh, in this case, I've chosen to make the uh, negative terms not. Uh, another way to do it would be to scale the weights. Uh, so you'd have positive and negative weights. Uh, it's kind of up to you uh, what works best. So what do we get from this? Here, we're, we're, you know, rocky outcrop might be a good term in the SVM class indicating presence of mountain lines, but it isn't a mountain line, right? And so this is why you're not going to do inline markup. You don't want to mark up rocky outcrop as mountain lion. But you might want to extract some triples here for further analysis to say, hey, these observations seem to be associated with things that I know indicate mountain lions. I mean, that's sort of what we're doing here. Is it's more of an infer inferential operation. Uh, so what are we doing here? We're doing CTS train and CTS walk. We're not using CTS classify. We're just using the rules we got from CTS train. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, can we calculate also the confidence of the inference? The, 
it, it's a little more, it's more indirect, right? Because I think if you used, if you used the, uh, the coefficients from the SVM class and map those into weights, and I think you don't want to use them directly because they're too small, so you, you want to scale them up a little bit, then I think that weighting, the scoring would give you, uh, you know, some, some reasonable number there that you could use to get, get that, yeah. And I should repeat the question. Um, what about scoring if you're doing this, uh, you know, you, this sneaky, sneaky trick? Um, and one last one, speaking of triples. Um, what if I have an ontology and I want to do entity extraction based on all that information about entities I have in my ontology? Um, can I do that? Well. Yes, and we have a bunch of customers who have done it. Um, but here's a way to think about it. Okay, entity extraction. I want to get the matching terms. Get matching terms, I need a CTS query style rule. So how do I get a CTS query style rule? I need to construct one out of terms. Therefore, I need to get terms from triples. That sounded complicated, but it's, it's actually not that Complicated. So here's a, here's a little bit of sparkle for pulling out uh, triples from uh, this, in, in this case, this is a SCOS ontology. Uh, simple knowledge, organization, organization. organization. something. <laughs> um, which is actually pretty popular for representing entity ontologies. Uh, and so it has concept scheme, which you can think of as a kind of entity. It has concepts, which you can think of as a particular entity. Uh, and then there are uh, names and labels and alternative labels. And we're just going to pluck those labels and use those as queries. Um, so this is, I'm just selecting them out. You need to do a little bit of consolidation to get them down into a single map. So let's say I have done that. Um, now I'm constructing a CTS query out of that. So it's just a big OR query. Um, you know, with a little futzing around to get the uh, language for the word correct. Um, but it's just a bunch of word queries. Now, I would say, if you're doing this in practice, what you're probably going to need to do, because the labels in the ontology were not designed for this purpose, what you're probably going to need to do is construct contextual queries. So it's easiest to think of this for things like location, right? phrases that you want in textual proximity to your target terms. So things like near to, south of, on the border of, for location-y kinds of entities, right? Um, you only need to do that once per entity type, um, but I think you, you will need to do that. You're get a, gonna get a lot of false hits otherwise. So this is entity extraction using an ontology. So we're going from triples to terms to CTS query rules, and from that we're sort of doing the normal entity extraction thing of documents to rules to terms. So your tool for getting at triples is SEM Sparkle. Um, for getting from rules to documents, excuse me, documents to rules is reverse query, as ever, and then getting the matching terms, CTS highlight. All right, we're going through a lot of stuff. But now we can sort of flesh out our little dictionary of Proto-Indo-European for search. Um, relationships involving rules, okay? So rules to documents. Um, this is CTS search. This is serialization. You know, we've, we've seen this a few places where we've stuck queries in documents so we can search them. That's serialization. Uh, rules to terms. This is query formulation, XCMP plan. Uh, also the highlighting entity extraction part. Uh, also, CTS registered query. What that does is construct a single term, in effect, out of a whole query. Um, and that's why registered query is, gets you efficiency gains, is because it becomes a single term lookup instead of a complicated query execution. Uh, rule to rule, query transformation. We've sort of seen this implicitly. Uh, and composition, CTS and query, CTS or query are composing queries from queries. Uh, document relations. 
So going from a document to rule, we've seen this a million times. This is a reverse query, CTS reverse, cert, uh, reverse query. Also classification and classifier training. So CTS train, CTS classify. Um, from documents to terms, this is term extraction. Also indexing. This is what indexing does. When you load documents in Mark Logic, it's extracting terms. Document to document, various transformations. Also, I haven't talked about it today, but CTS similar query is a search operator that you feed in documents and you get out similar documents. So document to document. And finally, terms. You go from a term to a rule. This is reverse index lookup. We've seen this. Also, query construction. We've seen this a bunch of, bunch of ways. Uh, going from a term to a document is index lookup, index resolution, and also serialization. We've seen term serialized as documents in a few ways. And finally, term to term. This is the essence of search, matching terms. And also, with respect to CTS classify, of term vector similarity. That is the metric, is term vector similarity. So I'm going to leave this up and take your questions for the next however many minutes I have. Oh, come on. Somebody must have some question about search or anything. Yes? Can you slide the 66 Good question. Can I? Yes? Um, no, the before where you had the rule. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that essentially part of the document, right? Here I'm saving it as a document, yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be. Standalone document or part of a bigger document that... I would, um, in this case, right, because what we're going to do with this <coughs> is try and find all, the, all, the, all of these rules that match. Um, and so it's handier whenever you're doing search that the target of search, the scope of search is a document. So you might have other stuff in here you know, metadata about it, other information. But in terms of, I wouldn't put mon multiple rules in one document. I wouldn't do that. Because then now you're confused about which one was it really. All those rules, are they their own separate collection? Or it's all matched with your actual document of the observations? So the question was, should all these rules be their own collection or mixed with the observations? Um, I would use collections as an organizing principle in general. So every kind of thing you might be searching for, I'd make a collection for it. So, you know, I, I haven't sort of highlighted here, but I've had one collection for observations, one collection for entities, one collection for species, one collection for users. And I think that's a good way of organizing your information. And, you know, sometimes you have things that play in multiple collections, and that's okay. It can be in multiple collections. Um, but Collections are just a handy way of organizing because you can always use that as you know your first target of search. So it's winnowing down what you're looking for to that scope. Anyone else? Yes. So do you have a sample database that shows data and, and queries that do all these things? Uh, so the question is, do I have a sample database that shows all of this stuff? Uh, short answer, no. Alas, I do not. <laughs> I have pieces of it in various places but not organized in a nice way, no, sorry. Yeah? Are there other training uh, algorithms besides SVM instead of Mark Logic? Uh, so the question is, are there other training besides SVM? Um, no, we do have a cluster that does either k-means or, um, uh, what's the other one, latent semantic. But that's clustering, that's not classification, so it's a little different. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, so the question was about iterative training to the SVM. Um, and currently, we don't support that. Though I would say, for all of you interested in learning algorithms, talk to Stephen Buxton and ask him to add it to the requested feature list. <laughs> uh, yeah, front. I think I heard you say earlier that less training you know, there's a reductio ad absurdum argument here, but uh, so the, the, yeah, the question is about the sort of the less is more on training data. Um, 
And there's some basic rules of, of thumb here um, that you want, you, want a, you want your sample to at least cover 10% of your variability, but not um, more than 90%, right? I'm, I'm sort of over, I'm saying that badly, actually. Um, the, way, the way I would think about it, well, first of all, I'd say, um, you know, find yourself a good statistical book and read what it says rather than listening to me. Um, but the way to think about it is, um, if you think about, you're trying to capture the variance, okay? So the variability in your data. And if you think about your sort of your normal distribution, Variance goes with the square. So you actually kind of think about, take a square root of your population size and start with that as, as a good guesstimate of where to begin. Um, but you, what you'll find is, like I said, you, you can get into cases where if it's too small, you'll get overfitting. And if it's too large, you'll get it dominated by noise. And so you want to try to find a sweet spot in between. So it's actually probably easier to start with smaller ones and work your way up than larger ones and work your way down, I find. Your mileage may vary. Um, but I would definitely, in terms of the, um, the, setting the size of the term vector, so that's one of the options you control when you're training, that needs to be way smaller than you think. Like, as I said, the default is all terms, which in Mark logic can actually run into the tens of thousands on a document very easily. Um, and you, I've never seen going beyond 100 getting me any benefit whatsoever. And usually more down to 20 to 50 is the sweet spot in terms of term vector size. Because we do, we do some, you know, we do some uh, picking the best terms. Once you, set, once you set a cap, we'll try and pick the best set and we'll do some, uh, you know, um, Dimension reduction, um, but yeah, go small. Is there any support for when you're training data, say, cleaning it, sort of throwing out any obvious outliers? Or uh, so the question is about getting rid of obvious outliers. Um, no, we don't do that. What we do provide is some APIs that let you test the precision recall. So we'll do, we'll do those metrics for you so that you can, you can sort of iterate that way. Um, and I know some people have actually built sort of little training building apps that kind of do some of those things. Yeah. Uh, the sort of tricky reverse scoring that you mentioned kind of referred to the one group, that runs in time proportional to the number of rules that you get from the documents? Yeah, so the question was about the, uh, the Flipping the scoring around um, in the uh, rule-based classification and the performance characteristics of that. And it is, yes, for the number of rules the document matches, you're adding another round trip. So that's going to be your cost. So it's going to be slower than if you didn't do scoring at all. Um, but if you really, really want scoring, that's the way to do it. And the round trip runs out of indices. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the way I did, I did it as an unfiltered search. Uh, so yeah, you want to do it that way. There's no reason to filter. You already know it matches. All right. How's our time? Do we need to cut it off? Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Oh, come on, someone. Two more minutes. Someone's got something. Life, the universe. Yeah. Um, it, this is a sort of a question about the ontology and where do triples live and um, if you're using Sparkle to get at them in Mark Logic, we, we actually don't care whether you've done it as sort of managed triples or embedded in documents. Um, Sparkle is looking at both places. Uh, where the managed versus unmanaged, if you like triples, where that matters uh, has more to do with update and governance that way, right? Because if you're using Sparkle Update, it wants to be able to control where they live. 
Um, and if you want them to sort of be associated with a document and go away when the document goes away, they should be part of that document. And so that, that's sort of the decision point as far as that goes. Yeah. All right, last question. Yeah. Is there a reference application on the website somewhere? Not for all of this that I've talked about today. Uh, this is more of a let's expand your horizons, think about other things kind of talk, uh, but maybe someday. All right, well, thank you very much.